The overarching theme of the entire message can be summarized in this one statement. And you got to get this. If you don't get this, you don't understand anything that follows. Whatever the Lord has established or, or ordained, the enemy, the devil, he seeks to sabotage. If God ordained it, the enemy wants to undo it. That's it. And everything that is about to follow finds its grounding in that statement. So where do we look? To the book we look? Where the origin of order begins? Genesis 1, we were created in the image of God. In the likeness of God. In the image of God. There are, of course, characterological implications of being created in the image of God. There are spiritual implications, ethical implications, emotional implications, moral implications, and of course, physical implications. Therefore, as created in the image of God, ladies and gentlemen, as the church of Jesus Christ, you are a mirror of your creator. When you look in a mirror, it's a reflection of your image. When God looks at his creation, he sees the reflection of his image. Out of the mirror of God comes moral order. From the mirror comes moral. If we are created to, to mirror the image of God, why are we surprised that the enemy seeks to distort that mirror? You ever been to the funny house? You look in those mirrors and they're distorted. They don't give you a proper reflection of who you are. And that's what the enemy does. He distorts the mirror of God in man. So we begin by understanding with the imagery that ended that video that the mirror of God in man has been shattered by sin. And there's only one way to redeem what has been ruined. The image of God, the imago Dei in man, is redeemed by the perfect expression and representation of the image of God, the Bible tells us, in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He came to redeem that which was marred, the image of God in man. Man being created in the image of God has intrinsic worth and value and dignity. Rights given by God and God alone. So how do we know if we are properly, biblically reflecting the image of God? This is the charge. We have to answer a question. And it's the question that God actually asked of Adam. It's the first question which has great significance in the Bible from God to man. Did you know that? The first question in the Bible is actually from the serpent to Eve. Did God say? But the first question from God to man was a question about where are you? Now we know when that question was asked, Adam and his wife had already taken of the fruit of the tree of knowledge and good and evil, and they took that bite which thrusted humanity into sin. It's what marred the image of God in man. If you've ever been to a mall, an outlet, usually if you don't know where you're at, you might think you know where you're going, you might think you know the location that you need to end up at, but by and large, if you're like me, one of the first places I stop is the mall directory. And the mall directory has a map, an aerial view of each location and store. And it doesn't matter if you can memorize the location of the stores. If you don't know the most important marker on that map, and you know what it says, you are here. And what I believe is we're seeing men and women who don't know where they're at. We don't know where we're at in relation to where God's at. And if we don't know where we are, ladies and gentlemen, we will never know who we are. Adam and Eve. They took, they ate, tells us they hid and covered. To which God, 
He seeks them. And like Jesus' mission, he seeks to save that which is lost. Check this out. Genesis chapter 3, verse 9. The first question from God to man. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? What a question. I believe if we are willing to answer this question this morning from the word of God, we will be pushed closer to our Lord and Savior, but we will also be pushed closer to the revival of the image of God in man. It's a question that God knew the answer to. God knew where Adam was. God knew exactly where he was. He knows where you're at right now. He knows not where you're at physically. That's not what I'm talking about. He knows that. He, he wants to know where you're at spiritually. He wants to know where you're at emotionally. So God asked the question because he wanted Adam to recognize where he was. That was the first posture that God was after. Adam, where are you? Do you know where you are, man? Adam needed to answer this question. But at this point in the narrative, if you know your Bible, Adam has already covered himself and he's already hid himself and his wife from God. I want you to think about how ridiculous it is for an individual to try to hide from God. Trying to hide your presence from a God who has omnipresence might be the most insane thing ever. What are the ways that we men specifically cover ourselves? I think when we cover ourselves, it leads, it leads us to move away from God, not closer to God. We cover ourselves in a million different ways. Sometimes we cover ourselves to mask the pain that we are dealing with. Sometimes we cover ourselves with occupations and jobs and hobbies to run away from that gnawing feeling in my soul that I don't know who I am. I don't know why I'm here. I don't know why God has put breath in my lungs. I don't even want to consider it. And interestingly, a lot of the things that we cover ourselves with, men, they look good outwardly. But if we're being honest, they're your God inwardly. And we spend so much time and energy and effort with all the outward things, right? A job is good, but not good at the expense of your family, right? Making money, having resources, good if used to advance God's economy. Right before God asks the question, it tells us in verses 7 and 8, Ready? They ate, and here's the result. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. Now, the, the last verse in chapter 2 in Genesis, it actually tells us that they knew they were naked. It says the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. So you're giving a clue at the end of chapter 2 that they were naked, and they were unashamed in their nakedness. Right? There was no shame. And now... You're told that they know they're naked, which means they know there is shame. And because there's shame, they seek to cover up the shame with something that is only going to mask it. They find what was close, fig leaves. They sewed the fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Verse 8, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, one of the coolest, pun intended, verses in all the Bible. Likely, the Hebraic expression lends itself to knowing that at the same time every day is when God, the Lord God, would meet with his creation, Adam and his wife. It was something that they likely, look at me, it was something that they likely looked forward to every single day. The sound of the Lord God walking in the cool of the garden and they would meet him. Now, interestingly, they hear the sound of him coming and they're not enthusiastic to meet with him. In fact, it tells us they hide from his presence. This is the opposite of the divine design. Right away, the ramifications of the fall is man and woman are moving away from their designer. 
which is an interesting point. When the man and the woman move away from the designer, the man and the woman will want nothing to do with the design, the role. Why is this? Well, here's the point. It's simple. Sin. Sin causes us to cover. Sin causes us to cower. Sin in your life, undealt with, will cause you to cover. It will cause you to run and hide from God. It will cause you to justify everything in your life, right? Things may look good. They may sound good. They may feel good. But deep down inside, if you're being intellectually honest, you know things aren't good. And there needs to be a confession of that sin. There needs to be, there needs to be a posture that brings the sin to light. The Proverbs, chapter 28, verse 13, tells us, he who covers, ready, his sins will not prosper. The person that covers their sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. I love the Proverbs. From one vein, it gives you a negative, and usually it then turns and gives you a positive. Whoever covers his own sins they will not prosper, but whoever has the posture to confess their sins and forsake them, turn away from them, that is where mercy is given. And that is why before we can live out our God-given DNA of being a man of God, your God-given DNA of being a woman of God, we must come to the Son of God. There is only one way for the man and the woman who wants to be a mirror of their creator, the image of God, is to come back to the one who was sent to redeem that image. But more than that, man is very impressive. God has wired us with giftings and abilities and intellect. Man is able to build skyscrapers. Man has the capacity mentally to create mind-boggling technology man is impressive there's one thing man cannot do right man can send somebody into space man can set in orbit a satellite and monitor it man can do all those things and yet man cannot place himself in heaven it's one thing man cannot do. Man cannot settle this one account. He can settle every other account. And I remember actually walking with Scott Johnson and his family during the final few weeks of Scott's father's life, Mr. Johnson. An amazing man. I would sit with him over at the Methodist home, and we would just talk. And I would ask him questions about his life and his family and his upbringing and, and where he lived. And one thing I learned every single visit, whether Scott was there or not, was this man had settled his accounts. He was making sure his wife was going to be taken care of, his children were going to be taken care of, the family's affairs, every business that he had a part in, any money that he had made or stored up and saved was eventually going to find itself in the hands of his offspring. He settled every account humanly possible. But there was one account that we began to recognize that he could not settle on his own. And it was the account that Jesus Christ settled for his sin and my sin. And most of those visits were spent talking to him about his eternal security. Mr. Johnson, it sounds like you're earthly secure. What about your eternal security? And by God's grace, through those visits, planting the seeds of truth and listening to him give a coherent confession of faith, not in religion, not in Roman Catholicism, not in some confirmation, not in a confession booth, but in Jesus Christ alone, that when he took his final breath on planet earth, his accounts 
in every way, we're truly and fully settled. You see, that is because of the foreshadow that we read about in Genesis 3.21. When Adam and Eve sinned and God comes in and asks Adam, where are you? He, of course, gives them what is called the curses of sin laid out for the serpent himself and then Eve and then Adam. And then afterwards, it's one verse often overlooked, but it's the gospel explicitly expressed as early as Genesis chapter 3. It says, also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Now remember, previously, they clothed themselves. They covered themselves with fig leaves. And now here God, he is likely, most Bible scholars and commentators agree, that there had to have been a sacrifice, that there was a shedding of blood in some type of sacrifice, whether it was a lamb or another animal. Nonetheless, it was the sacrifice that was pre picturing, if you will, or foreshadowing the eventual sacrifice of Jesus to come and cover and cure right in this verse. And that is why if the God of sin causes us to cover and cower, it is the Son of God who came to cover and cure. This is the groundwork. You have to know about salvation in Jesus Christ alone before the image of God and man can be renewed. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. In Colossians chapter 3, I'll begin reading in verse 1. We'll end at verse 10. Listen to this sequence of truth. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Verse 5. Therefore, put to death your members, which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. All these things are placed on the throne of our hearts where Jesus Christ belongs. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. Ready for this? In which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. Paul is writing to the church and he is saying every member of the church of Jesus Christ once walked according to the lusts of our flesh and the lusts of our eyes and the pride of life. He's saying now put those things aside and by putting them aside or putting them off, what are we to put on? You ready? But now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have, here it is, verse 10, and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. And that one verse, guess where it throws you back, Bible student? It throws you back to Genesis. Paul's writing to the church in the first century and he's saying the old man, the first Adam, the sinner of you, the, nat the sin nature, that one needs to be put off. And if you put off the old man, you need to put on the new man. Well, who's the new man? He tells us, and he says it, the new man is renewed in knowledge. The knowledge is intimate knowledge. It's experiential knowledge. It's perfectly fitted knowledge in the original language. Perfectly fitted or customized knowledge according to what? The image of him who created him, the image of God in man. Renewing the image of God from Genesis chapter one that was marred and disfigured in Genesis chapter three by sin is being renewed according to the divine design, the icon, the image of God in man. And that is why the image of God in man that was marred by sin can only be mended by Christ, period. Can only be mended, can only be put back together, can only be redeemed by Christ, right? Romans 8, 28, famous Bible verse. 
I bet we can all quote it. We know all things work together for good to those that love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 29. Well, what's the good in Romans 8, 28? What's the good that he's working all things towards? It's, it's verse 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That's the good in God's eyes, that we would all be brought back into conformity to the image of the son, the divine design of God and man, that we would mirror his image. We are image bearers of the creator on planet earth. That's why sanctification is really just a journey back to Eden. It's interesting, we're going backwards, right? Back to Eden is the call, the invitation. And this is where you will find the image of God and man and God's original plan. So that's where we're going, Genesis 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Up to this point, he's speaking of mankind, okay? Mankind, humans. God created humans in his own image. In the image of God, he created mankind, him. And then he splits the atom. Male and female, he created them. Now, this is more about the character logical the moral, the ethical, the emotional, the spiritual, than it is the physical. There likely is a reflection physically that God had in mind. It was no mistake to make us with two legs and two arms and the way we're shaped and formed. But what was imprinted in God's chief crown of creation, man, was intrinsic worth, dignity, and value, but was also internal that was supposed to be tethered to what was eternal in a word character men of character humans that have character you know what i define character as inward attitude inward attitude the inward attitude of your heart why did god create us in his own image one as a reflection of him two as a protection by him. This one's often not taught or talked about. You are created as a reflection of God, and that creative order is also for your own protection. Did you ever wonder why the world attacks male and female? Right here it tells us that God made us male and female. Did you wonder why male or masculinity female femininity when the world attacks and assaults those what do you get you get out of balance you get lines that are biblical boundaries for the flourishing of humans you get lines being blurred i'm trying to help you see the world from the word of god see there's this term that is applied to men and it's toxic finish it masculinity and I get what they're saying but can I help you understand what they're saying and why they're saying it see there's no such thing as toxic masculinity they just took a word that is biblical male masculine and they added an adjective to it and the reason they do that is because they don't want men in their divine design biologically spiritually who are supposed to be wired to be brave and strong and courageous by divine design. So if I start to act like the alpha male as I am a reflection of my savior, here's what happens. That's toxic masculinity and I don't wanna be identified as being toxic, so I back up. No, there's no such thing as toxic masculinity. I'll tell you what there is. There's evil men, there's evil hearts, and what is evil comes out of those hearts and becomes either oppressive or chauvinistic or dictatorial but there's no such thing as toxic masculinity it's just one of the ways the world gets men to try to stay on the sidelines instead of getting involved and on the other side femininity Here, here's what happens they take masculinity and they castrate it or weaken it and now you got males 
being girly. When we should be manly. And then femininity, you got movements built around feminism. So when the Bible tells us the woman, the female, is of the weaker vessel, that is not a, a statement of degradation. It just simply means physiologically, you're the weaker vessel. And that's a beautiful thing, like a flower. But femininity, when it's taken to the extreme, masculinity, castrated, and main girly, femininity, stiffened, calloused, and made manly. Are you understanding what's happening here? The maleness, according to God's divine design, is being castrated. The femaleness, according to God's divine design, is being casted and hardened. Both created in the image of God, that means equality. Did you know that? Men and women, equality, not equity. Not equity. Equity means different assets. There are things that men can do that women can't do. There are things that women can do that men can't do. And when submitted to the word of God, both begin to flourish perfectly. See, I don't think I need to mention the obvious, but I will in light of the present ridiculousness. And I'm going to say this on behalf of Landmark Church. I'm going to say it unashamedly, unapologetically. We believe here. At Landmark Church, we believe it with all of our hearts that men are better than women at being men. <laughs> and we believe that women are better than men at being women. And because we live in a world of copy and paste and edit and, of course, publish something I said but no context, I said, I'm going to say it again. I'm going to make sure they put it on all the screens just in case it finds itself out there on the World Wide Web saying, look at this bigot pastor from Ocean City, and he said, men are better than women. And they didn't complete my quote. So here's the quote. Men are better than women at being men. That's biblical. And women are better than men at being women. Who would have thought we would have to make such a claim? <laughs> now here's what happens. After we understand being created in the image of God, male and female, Verse 28 is where we're going to camp. Verse 28 lends itself to a lot of teaching. There's a lot here. Verse 28, then God blessed them. God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Right, there are four separate commands here. Be fruitful, multiply, Fill the earth, subdue it. I want to take these in the order they're laid out, but also present them in a way that we can understand, not just for the man, but for the woman. The first thing we are commanded to do is be fruitful. Be fruitful and multiply. The idea behind being fruitful is not just contained in Genesis 1. It's reiterated by Jesus himself and by the pen of Paul about being fruitful. Multiple times, what does it mean to be fruitful? Right here it speaks of two things simultaneously. The first is absolutely sexual reproduction. Be fruitful and multiply. Man and woman have children, procreate. But it's not just sexual reproduction, it's also spiritual replication. And that's the one we often neglect. That God brings a man and a woman together for sexual reproduction, but more so for spiritual replication. To be fruitful and multiply is for you to understand you are a worker in the garden of God. He has placed you to be a fruitful worker in the midst of his garden. Whether that be in marriage, in your family, or in your community, you are to be a fruitful worker. And there are things as a fruitful worker. One, Jesus said, you have to be connected to me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you're connected to me, you live in me, you abide in me, you allow me to be your image renewed, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can, you can bear no fruit. You can do nothing. Jesus said that. Yeah. Paul said that there's a fruit of the Spirit. And that fruit is produced by staying connected to the Spirit. 
walking in the Spirit, and you will produce fruit. Jesus said that we are to be cautious and beware of false prophets. Matthew chapter 7. We often think the usage of the word prophet in the context, hear me on this. Matthew 7, beware of false prophets. They'll come to you looking like sheep, outwardly, inwardly, ravenous wolves. Hey, can a good tree produce bad fruit? And can a bad tree produce good fruit? No, a good tree produces good fruit, and a bad tree produces bad fruit. You will know them by their You will know who by their fruit. See, he's using the negative to present the positive. You will know them by their fruit. You will know false prophets. The word prophet is not just a religious term in the context. Did you get this? The word prophet is anyone that speaks and communicates information, data, anything that is being communicated that comes from a pseudo lens. That means false or fake or lies. Beware of people that are speaking as if they know, but they're telling you something that is further from the reality of truth. See, misinformation is one of the most deadly weapons on planet Earth, misinformation and lies. So I'm wondering, are we being fruitful with the seeds that we're speaking? Are we being fruitful in the creeds that we're proposing? What do I mean by that? As men and women of God, I believe to be a fruitful tree, a tree of righteousness, you, of course, need to be rooted in the word of God. The language of God in his word needs to be the language of your tongue. Your native tongue or your native language should be one that speaks the word. Too many of us know the language of the world. And we've come to the Lord, and yet nothing has changed. And we're still natives of this land. And we're supposed to be fruitful workers. I want to plant the right seeds amongst the people. I want to plant the right seeds amongst my family. I heard one of the ministers that I follow talk about family creeds. And I loved it. He said, do you have a family creed? He says, men. Did you put a creed over your family? Then he began to tease it out and explaining what he meant. Like, do you have these mission statements, if you will, for your family? Something that everybody that's under your direct influence and authority can either memorize, something they can know. He began by stating one of the important creeds of his home is that everyone in his house would know that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I love that. I was like, that is probably the most important mantra for a man of God to place over his home, over his marriage, over his family. And for obviously the ministers to place over this church. As for me and this house, we're going to serve the Lord. Amen. Right? And I want to plant the right seeds as a father of two. And I know they're pliable right now. They're moldable right now. And if I don't plant my seeds of truth, you better believe there's someone or something out there in that world that is going to plant their seeds. Because Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruit. So I went home after hearing that minister say, do you have family creeds? And I set out to work with my daughter, Willow. Creeds and seeds. And I wanted to just like pound into her the importance of God. But how do you do that with a three or four-year-old mind? So I said, hey, Willow, and I would quote the Joshua verse, Willow, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I kept saying it to her. Every day, I just kept saying it to her. Willow, as for me and my house, and I would stop. And eventually, when I stopped, she finished the sentence. Hey, Willow, in this house, and her mind went into that verse, we will serve the Lord. And every day I would find a new thing to say to her over and over and over. And it was a long time in the making. But eventually, understanding creeds and seeds, Willow and the children that God has given you, they need to know who they are. And more importantly, 
They need to know whose they are. Watch this. Willa Joy? What? In this house? We serve the Lord. Why did God give you gifts? To get His glory. Why did God give you wisdom? To lead His people. Why did God give you character? To reflect His image. Why did God give you courage? To stand for truth. And why did God make you beautiful? To look like mommy. What do you have to say to the people? Thank you. Sure. Hey, do not be fooled. For every one video like that, there's a thousand that I dare not publish. But I decided to every day plant a seed and propose a creed. Now doubtful she has any clue of the depth of her answers. My prayer, according to the word of God, is that I would train her up in the way of the word so that when she's older, that foundation, that she would not depart from it. See, to be a fruitful worker, you got to understand creeds and seeds. Then it tells us to multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. I looked at this idea behind filling the earth. Was it just fill the earth with humans? Well, that was part of it. But do you think God would want to just fill the earth with humans who would be heathens? Or would he want to fill the earth with humans who were Christians? And there's plenty of verses that talk about the earth is filled with the glory of God. And if the earth is already filled with the glory of God, the question is, Am I contributing to the glory of God? Is my life and my family and my role as a man, am I being, ready, a fruitful worker? Am I being a faithful worshiper? Worship is not reduced to three songs on a Sunday. That's not what the word worship means biblically. Worship is obedience to God's word. Worship, as Paul would write it, in the most menial tasks of life. I can imagine, as he's being inspired by the Holy Spirit, He's writing something that he's looking at and going, really? Paul was a missionary on mission, willing to give up his life. He was willing to die for the cause of Christ. And he's documenting some of the admonishments and the edifications to the church. And he comes to these few verses, right? He wrote it two different times, one in Colossians, one in Corinthians. And he was like, really, Lord? This is what you want me to write? I just got done writing about giving you glory whether I live or whether I die. God's like, write it. Whether you're eating or drinking, do it unto the glory of God. Why? Because they're mindless, menial things that we do day by day. And God was telling his people that I want you to live in such a way that every single thing that you do is to my glory, honor, and praise. That you can live even when nobody's looking in the privacy of your own home, as you wash the ditches, as you do the laundry, as you are studying for the job, you're doing it with all of your heart to the glory of God. You are a faithful worshiper. Do you understand that? Even in the secular workplace, you are called to be a faithful worshiper. Fill the earth with his glory. Fill the earth with his truth. Out of that, faithful workers faithful worshipers. You're also called to be faithful watchers. This one struck me. Faithful watchers? Yeah. Do you understand the times? I guess God is saying, Adam, where are you? To the church of Jesus Christ, filled with men, God is saying, where are you? Are you a faithful watcher? Are you watching? Are you on guard? Are you vigilant? Are you aware what is out there and what's coming in to influence and infiltrate? Are you aware what your children are exposed to when they leave your home? Do you have any idea the cesspool of social media and how quickly one scroll can expose them to sites and scenes that they cannot unsee. And I know we can't control everything, men, but we are responsible to be watchful. 
right, there's really only three types of watchers. There's the faithful watcher. The Bible says that's the watchman on the wall. He's sounding the alarm. But then there's these other two types of watchers. And sadly, many in the church fit these two categories. There's the fearful watcher. You know, they're the ones that watch, they see it, but they're fearful to act or speak. So they just sit off on the sideline. You can see a lot of the fearful watchers in all these videos that go viral. It doesn't make a difference where the video is being recorded. You'll watch and see, especially in a group setting, it's called bystander effect. And you're seeing something that's egregious, evil, somebody getting their head kicked in and people just watch. Why do we just watch and not act? But there's another type of watcher. It's not the fearful watcher. It's worse than that. It's the feastful watcher. Oh, no, that's the person who, in the midst of that situation, they take out their phone. There are those who freeze, and there's a real social, psychological effect. But then there are those who take out their phone and record it and then post it. And in 2021, there was a woman on a train in Philadelphia who was being sexually assaulted and everybody just watched and a handful took out their phones and recorded and watched a demonic, depraved man who was supposed to be created in the image of God, who has been marred by sin and has become degenerate, attacking another image bearer of God and other image bearers of God all stood around. Some were fearful and some worse were feastful. And they wanted their minute of fame because their video went viral. Where are the men? I believe a strong church is made up of men who are willing to fulfill their biblical role. I believe this church is made up of strong men. But I'm calling this church to account. If you want to protect this body, you need to get involved. If you want to protect what's happening here, as God has called you to, you need to get off the seats and get involved. The day is getting shorter. The times are getting darker. And I believe if men, maleness, masculinity, be brave, be strong, understood, we would be what it tells us, fill the earth and subdue it. Subdue it. That is a military word, right? It extends itself to gardening, right? Keeping it, tending to it, but subdue it. God has given man dominion. We're fruitful as we work. We're faithful as we worship. We're faithful as we watch. And here's the one, you ready for it? Subdue it. Be forceful as a warrior. You are a worker, a worshiper, a watcher, and you are a warrior man of God. Be forceful. Don't let the world tell you that having force and strength is toxic because it's not. Ancient history tells us during the Greco-Persian Wars, Xerxes himself would send delegates to each city-state. Before he would conquer, he would invite. He would invite them to submit and surrender. And he would absorb them into his massive world army. And as he sent his delegates to these city-states like Athens and Corinth and Thebes, he discovered that each of those city-states had walls. But one amongst many did not, and that was Sparta. And the delegate arrived and called for the king, and the king came himself, and he said, King, Leonidas, history believes, your neighbors have walls, and yet their walls were not enough to keep our forces from conquering. So we're giving you the option. Clearly, without walls, you are exposed. So where are your walls? To which the king gave that famous call, oh, and all of his soldiers, the men of the community came out, and he said to the delegate, we are the wall. 
We are the wall. Men, you are the wall. You are immovable when you're in your right biblical place. And the mark of a man of God is God upon the man. And that is why we need men that are so marked by Christ that their lives become landmarks for Christ. And a landmark helps other people orient where they're at. So when you know where you're at and you know who you are, you then take your right biblical place so that others can orient their lives around the truth. That's what a landmark is. So I'm going to end by giving you four questions simultaneously that I believe if you can ask yourself these questions in any given scenario, any given situation, men and women, when you walk into a room, when you go to work, if you could ask yourself these four questions, it will help orient what you need to do. The first question is, what is absent that needs to be present? Walk into the room, ask yourself, what is absent that needs to be present? The second question, what is broken that needs to be mended? What is broken that needs to be mended? Third question, what is evil that needs removal? What is evil that needs removal? Fourth question, what is good that needs to be guarded and grown? Those are the four questions up front, now one at a time. What is absent that needs to be present? And only you can provide or bring that which is missing. What is it in you, man? What is it in you, woman, when you walk into a situation in your home and you recognize something's absent and only I can bring it? What is that? What's absent in you that needs to be present? More intimacy with Jesus? More devotions in his word? More prayer? Like what, if you're honest, what is absent that needs to be present? What is absent in your marriage that needs to be present? Men! What is absent in your family that needs to be present? Then make your way to the second question. What is broken that needs to be mended? If you're being honest, what's broken in me that needs to be mended? What's broken in my marriage that needs to be mended? What is broken in my family that needs to be fixed? What's broken in this community that needs to be repaired? And only you can bring it. And then the third question, what is evil that needs removal? What is evil that needs removal? Now I want to use a picture to illustrate. Now if the picture, figuratively speaking, the vulture, if we can all agree, symbolically would represent evil, right? You got a child that's vulnerable. The vulture is a scavenger. It's preying on the child. We'd all agree. What is evil in this picture that needs to be removed? We'd all agree. The vulture. Would we agree? Okay. Now I'll ask the fourth question with the same picture. What is good that needs to be guarded and grown? We'd all, we'd, we'd all agree, based on the metaphor, the child is good, the child needs to be guarded, the child needs to be grown. Well, what if I told you that the vulture was removed, but the child remained? What if I told you that? What if I told you the reality of that picture is that it was taken by a South African photographer named Kevin McCarty? And when he took this picture, he waited to get the right lens or frame, submitted his picture when he got home, to which the New York Times published it in 1993, to which a flood of responses came in, many of which asking, what happened to the child? What happened to the child? The New York Times ran another story stating the photographer shooed away the vulture and assumed that the child would make it to one of the United Nations feeding centers. But we do not know, was basically what they said. Eventually, in 1994, the, the photographer won the Pulitzer Prize for this photo. It highlighted the famine in Sudan. And that picture spoke volumes. And yet, soon after that photographer won the Pulitzer, he could not handle the weight of that question. What happened to the child? He didn't have an answer. We can't judge him because we weren't there. We don't know what he was thinking. We don't know. We don't know where the child went after that. Many wondered, why did he not help the child? He eventually took his own life because of the weight. So you have a man who took his own life a child who likely lost her life and a picture that stands 
What's the point? Here's the point as we close. I believe that picture is analogous of our times. You better believe there are plenty of vultures that are waiting to prey on our children. And our children are the most vulnerable of God's creation. And there are vultures waiting. And I'm saying to this assembly, what good is it to remove the vulture and leave the child? So yeah, let's get those sick, sexually explicit, disgusting books out of the schools. But listen to me. Removing the vulture and yet leaving the child. I am convinced if we guard and grow the child, by default, we will remove the evil. We will remove the vulture. And I believe when men understand and women understand our call as image bearers of God to protect the most vulnerable amongst us, women and children, to share truth unapologetically, we will do what God has called us to do. And what is that? We'll answer the question, where are you? And I will answer, right here, Lord. I'm broken. I'm done covering up. I'm done cowering. I need Jesus to come. I need him to cure. I need to give you my heart and my life and my family and my marriage and my community and my church. I need you to use me, Lord. I need your image to come back so I can mirror it. This is the charge for the church. When you know where you are, you will know who you are. Let's pray. So, Father, this is your word. This is your charge. These are your people. So I pray that we would understand what has been laid out before us this day. And that picture would be seared in our souls. And we would be mindful of those four questions we'd ask ourselves. We would bring exactly what is needed in any circumstance, any situation. We'd bring truth where there is lies. And it wouldn't just be about sheltering our children as much as it would be about showing our children the truth. Yes, yeah, shelter from lies, but show the truth. Would that be our call? Would you bless this household? Would you bless these families? Would you inspire these men? In the name of Jesus, amen.